and, and get started. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the uh, 2021 Master of Liberal Arts Capstone Forum. This is our second virtual version of this on Zoom last year because we were forced to go to Zoom due to the uh, early phases of the pandemic, kind of make, forcing us all home and to remote learning and remote administration and program management. So it's been an odd year for all of us, but we continued um, to do it virtually this year because it helps us improve access and allows a lot more people to join us for this really wonderful annual event where a number of our recent alumni get to talk about their capstone projects. Um, we have five really great presenters tonight, Andrew Cassell, Robert Scheider, Emily Waller, Samia Akalika, and Rand Holman, who have, are doing projects that range from the history of ancient mathematics to gender ambiguity to cybersecurity and international politics, you name it. Um, so it says a lot about the breadth of the liberal arts at a place like Penn and the real amazing range of subjects that students in the MLA pursue and then use to create those concentrations to develop their own individualized programs of study, and then ultimately write their own final capstone paper. And every year we then invite folks who graduated in the last three terms to step up and present and share some of their uh, findings from their capstone and tell you all a little bit about their MLA experience, how they arrived at their capstone topic, and more about the specific subject that they researched and wrote about. And it's really usually pretty fascinating. Um, so I appreciate all of you attendees that could join us. We're also recording this, which will be great. So if you know anybody else who couldn't make it but wants to see these, hopefully we'll be able to share these videos later. This is the webinar format, which means that all the panelists are co-hosts, they'll share their screens, they'll go through their presentations. And during their presentations, if you wanna type questions into the Q&A feature, I'll keep track of those. And when they finish their individual talks, I'll recapitulate the questions and share them with the presenters and they can answer those questions. We'll move on to the next speaker. And then at the end, when everybody's done, their presentations will open up for a panelist discussion, but also we'll be able to, again, answer and dig into any questions that you throw into the Q&A. So it's a good way for you guys to ask specific questions about topics, subject matter, but also about how some of these uh, great alumni managed to do their program uh, and sort of take a new page in their life out of the MLA uh, book and move ahead and have a lot of fun here at Penn, which is my watchword. If grad school is not fun, I don't think you should do it. Um, but also it's the kind of thing that really can be so mind broadening and illuminating um, and personally gratifying that it lets you kind of, uh, one of my alumni years ago said, make yourself into a better version who you always wanted to be. Um, and I know that sounds a little bit um, soft and squishy and liberal artsy, but in a way I think it's really great to get in touch with those things that really um, excite you from an academic and intellectual point of view, because generally what you do to dig into those subjects will actually influence and have uh, repercussions in what you do in your day job, such as it is. And that's different for all of us based on where we're coming from and where we're going next. So I hope you enjoy hearing um, these great presentations. Um, in years past, I used to make them read to me in advance and I got bored because I always knew what was coming. So now these are new. I did skim their slides, so I had a little preview and I know what they're talking about, but it's gonna be new for me as well, which is always kind of fun. So thanks uh, for joining us. I'm gonna kick it off by inviting Andrew Cassell to present. He's a retired former journalist. He spent 35 years in the newspaper business. Most of them at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I remember reading a lot of his columns. He wrote a lot about the city and culture and other things. And he served a number of years as an online editor. He did a bit of teaching before ending his half century gap year and then went back to school and earned his MLA. His capstone is Retrieving a Voice from the Ghetto, the Aharon Pick Diary. Andrew. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Chris. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm the oldest recipient of an MLA, but I'm definitely on the high end of the spectrum. Uh, and it, for me, it was another joy to, uh, after I retired, to enroll and start taking classes. I'd always had a deep, uh, interest in history that I'd never really been able to pursue it sufficiently. Uh, and when I got into the, the program, I took a whole bunch of different courses involving history and globalization and uh, immig immigration. Uh, and uh, it, it all began to kind of percolate and it resonated particularly with some family research that I'd been doing for a number of years. And uh, in that regard, 
one of the things I discovered when looking into the life of my old, my grandfather, who had died before I was born, was that uh, back when he was uh, living in Lithuania, in what is now Lithuania, at that time it was the Russian Empire, as a young man, he had uh, had a, a good friend whose name was Aaron Pick. And uh, my grandfather emigrated to the United States, did the best he could, uh, was active in a number of different pursuits, uh, did, some, did, did a fair amount of writing, which I've been able to discover and kind of put together and dig up. Uh, his friend Aaron Pick uh, stayed in Europe and became a medical professional, became a doctor. Now, as, as young men, they had, um, uh, they had joined in a, here I'll, I really need to share a screen at this point. Uh, how do I do that? Let's see, here we go. Okay, so is that, is that showing? Okay, so uh, the two gentlemen there, uh, the seated gentleman is my grandfather. And the fellow standing next to him with his hands akimbo is Aaron Pick. This was taken about 1904 in uh, Lithuania, uh, just before my grandfather emigrated to the United States. Pick, as I said, went on to become a uh, doctor. He studied in France and after World War I returned to Lithuania, which at that time, by that time, was uh, independent and it had gone through a tremendous social change. Pick uh, practiced medicine in a town uh, in Lithuania, the name of which at, when they, in those years was Shadli. Uh, but when Lithuania became independent, it became known as Shaolai. It's one of the, like the third or maybe fourth largest city in, in Lithuania uh, then and now. And he was uh, very active in the, in the local hospital over, directed a couple of the departments, uh, had a thriving practice, radiology and uh, general medicine, uh, and was also socially very active, was a Zionist, was a promoter of civic causes within the Jewish community there. And through the 20s and 30s, uh, you know, became a fairly respected fellow. Uh, was, had, was married, had a, had a, had a son. Uh, let's see if I can find this next picture. There he is. This is him. Uh, in the 30s with his wife and son, whose name was Tedic, Theodore or Tedic. Uh, when this, in 1940, the Soviet Union and, and, and the Germany, the, the famous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, carved up Eastern Europe. Hitler invaded Poland, the Soviets invaded from the East and eventually moved in and took over Lithuania. Uh, life completely changed. Uh, the, 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 the society was uh, collectivized, uh, their assets were seized, people lost their, their private fortunes, and uh, the entire or social order was overturned. This lasted one year, uh, and then the Nazis invaded Russia, and uh, that included then Lithuania. Uh, at that point, they began a uh, what we now talk about is the Holocaust. Uh, by invaded, the invasion took place in July. By September, almost 80% of all the Jews in Lithuania had been murdered. And the rest had been put into ghettos. And that included a ghetto in Shaolai. And Pick and his family were among those confined to the ghetto. Uh, while, once he was there, he began compiling a journal. And that journal, he kept, he kept writing his observations of the, what was happening and his accounts of what he had been hearing about, about the uh, slaughters in Lithuania and focusing his, his attention on life in the, in the ghetto. Uh, he kept that up right up until uh, the middle of 1944. At that point, the, uh, the, the Germans planned to liquidate the ghetto and send all of the uh, people who were, had survived to that point into concentration camps. Uh, Pick himself did not survive to see that. He died in July of, or June or July of 44. His last entry was June 7th, 1944. And, and interestingly, it was the, the, the day after the D-Day invasion, his last diary entry 
was uh, elation that the Allies had finally invaded uh, France and, and were hopefully coming to uh, bringing closer the end of the Nazi regime. Uh, the journal, uh, he, before, at that point, his son then uh, escaped the, the ghetto, but before he did, he buried the journal and uh, fled. And, and after the Soviets came back and liberated the ghetto, uh, the son came and dug up the journal and eventually took it with him to Israel. Let me just keep moving here a little bit into the slides. This is Pick in, in, the, in the 30s, running a clinic for children. It was, was one of his functions. Um, and this is the, the Nazi, one of the Nazi uh, uh, flyers or a piece of information that they were, they were uh, circulating to report on what they had done. The, uh, what they called the Einsatzgruppen, who were the, the killing, mobile killing squads had followed the Wehrmacht into Eastern Europe. And, you can, they, and they sort of toted up the number of Jews who had been murdered in each of the Balk Baltic countries. Lithuania, you see it was 136,000. But at that point, they still were noting that there were 128,000 Jews still alive. That was not the case by the time, by the end of the war. Um, life in the ghetto was, as you can imagine, quite horrible. Uh, this is a picture taken in, in the Shaoli ghetto of some German officers lining up some of the Jewish community leaders. There's a, a couple of rabbis in there and some others shortly before they were taken to be shot. And here's a, a picture of one of the places nearby where the Nazis uh, conducted the, the murders. Um, Pick's journal uh, detailed all of this. He had uh, pretty superior access to information, partly because even while he was imprisoned in the ghetto, he was able to uh, work in the main town of Shavli, of Shalai. He, he didn't, he didn't, he couldn't have his old job in the hospital, but the Nazis uh, kept a few of the doctors employed as technicians. And he ran the radiology, they were, he had an, ex, an a expertise in x-ray equipment. And so he, he operated a radiology lab as kind of a lab assistant, which was uh, not much, but it kept him alive for some of those years. Um, at any rate, this is a page, two pages from the journal he kept. Uh, it's written in Hebrew. It, is, uh, it takes up about 300 pages of, of notebooks. There's like three volumes of, of notebook writing. And what happened to this journal is uh, after the war, Pick's son took it to Israel and put it in a drawer. And it sat there basically for 50 years. Uh, it wasn't until the late 90s, not 97, that uh, some of the some other fellow survivors from the Lithuanian Jewish community in Israel persuaded his family to uh, pu publish a transcript, a version in, in Hebrew. And that came out in Israel in a paperback edition, small, limited paperback edition, did not get much circulation, but did get some press attention. And I heard about it because I was very interested in, in Aaron Pick and I had established a kind of bunch of contacts of people who, uh, uh, who, who were involved with that community. I'm gonna stop the share at this point. Uh, and uh, the, I, 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 I was very eager to read the, read the journal because uh, I thought maybe perhaps it would help me understand my grandfather better, among other things. And I was just super curious about Pick as well. Uh, about four years ago, I heard that the US Holocaust Museum had actually acquired the original manuscript of the journal. And in fact, they had it digitized on their website, but they did not have it translated. So it was there in the original Hebrew. Uh, long process of back and forth discussions, me with them, them with other people and uh, took place. And uh, the upshot was that uh, early in 2020, I was put in touch with a retired uh, engineering professor from the University of Virginia, who was a native Israeli and who had already undertaken to uh, do a, a translation of the, of the diary. His, his ability to do it, however, uh, was somewhat limited, partly because he wasn't an English, a native English speaker and, and because the diary itself was written in a very kind of archaic 
type of Hebrew, it was not written in, in the kind of modern Hebrew that Israelis speak and write uh, today. It was written in, Pick had, had had a traditional 19th century Jewish yeshiva education. He had spent year, many years going to uh, schools where, where the entire curriculum consisted of traditional, the Bible, the Talmud, rabbinic writings, and he was totally versed in that. And it was when he sort of decided that that, that, that wasn't enough for him, that he uh, broke out of the mold, essentially, began to study secular subjects, learned Russian, uh, studied languages, studied science, and eventually got himself to Paris to study medicine. So he had these two kind of different kinds of, of orientations. One was, was traditional, it was, it was rooted in, in uh, rabbinic Jewish texts and, and old, old style thinking, and the other was scientific. And he brought both of these to bear in the journal. And what, it, what that meant was that it was a very difficult journal to translate because it's every, pa every page, every, almost every sentence contained some reference, some, some quotation from Leviticus or uh, the Talmud or, or some ancient biblical, ancient rabbinic Jewish text. And all of that had to be kind of woven together uh, or, or converted into idiomatic English. Uh, in a way that, that contemporary readers could understand. So working with uh, this, this fellow, Gabby Lawfer uh, from Virginia, uh, I was able to uh, essentially take his, 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 his piece, his, his work and edit it uh, and annotate it. And the result, was, it was a, uh, about a 200 page Microsoft double space, Word double space text with 800 footnotes. Uh, which was a, a, trans, a translation of Pick's journal. It's, um, I'll, I'll see if I, can, I'll, if I can get out of the, uh, okay, yes. I can read you a couple of quotes, a couple of passages briefly. Pick had, uh, he had, he had uh, a very sort of a particular orientation, but he, he was a, a, also a very objective, uh, viewer of what was going around during the time of the uh, of the Soviet regime, uh, he he writes in his journal, for example, uh, it is undeniable that the Bolshevik regime was founded on the principles of law and justice. Yet it is also impossible to deny that in general and in our city in particular, its actions were characterized by injustice, wickedness, stupidity, madness, and folly. Although the Bolshevik regime destroyed the economic well-being of merchants and entrepreneurs who made up the majority of Lithuanian Jews, at the same time, it saved us all from the hands of those who sought to kill us. So you can see, you know, he was, he's he, it's going through this, he's balancing different realities and trying to sort of steer a course and, and understand it in light of what he knows. Um, later, when he's in the ghetto, begins a passage by, with a quote from, uh, 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 I think it's a biblical quote, but it's used in, in modern contemporary synagogue prayers. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. The ghetto streets that stretch over hills and slopes are unpaved and have no sidewalks. When the snow melts or after a pouring rain, they fill with mud and muck. In summer, they are filled with dust. The houses are small and low without form or beauty. That again is a paraphrase or a quotation from a rabbinic text. The homes are crowded and cold in winter and unbearably hot in summer because the cook stoves are in the living space. They're also filthy, filled with fleas, cockroaches, and mice. The inhabitants are depressed and tormented. They lack sufficient food. The restrictions are hard and ever growing and bereavement saturates us all with sorrow and grief. It's a, it's a, it's, I, I became totally, uh, fascinated with, with this document. And, and, and at the same time, it was, it was really hard to read because it's grim stuff. Life in the, for these people in the ghetto started out horrible and it got worse. And it was one thing after another. Uh, and he recounts it with you know, sort of unstinting uh, detail and objectivity. Uh, and yet he's, he, he, in between, he sort of gives these sort of passages that sound like sermons that sound he's pleading not pleading with God because actually he turns out 
for all his religious upbringing and his traditional uh, orientation, he was not a very religious man at all. His references to God are almost uh, snide. They're almost uh, uh, sort of satirical. He talks about other people in the ghetto who, you know, are, are believers, and he doesn't understand why they're why they don't understand that the, that their God has completely deserted them and that they're all doomed. Uh, but it, 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 the way he writes and the depth and the detail is just completely absorbing. And I just uh, totally found myself uh, in, engrossed in this thing. And, and, and uh, anyway, it was a long slog. It took about six or eight months to go through the whole text. Uh, but it, it served as, a, uh, as the core of this capstone. The other part of it was uh, an, an essay. I basically I, I researched and wrote an introductory essay in which I took this piece and I tried to sort of, or took the document and I tried to explain why I thought, I think it's, it was important and deserves, you know, to be uh, recognized by scholars and also to put it in, a, in the context of Holocaust research generally. Uh, as you may know, you know, for as since, since the forties, uh, people have been trying to understand the Holocaust and there have been any number of, of books and, and essays and debates and, and from all different angles. And, and there's been a kind of an evolution over time as ev different evidence has come out. Uh, early on, there, 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 there wasn't much in the way of uh, uh, written testimony. A lot of these diaries that were found, I mean, Anne Frank is the one that everybody knows about, but uh, many, many other diaries came out of the, of the Holocaust from people who were in ghettos or in hiding. And it just, it often took decades for those to, uh, find audiences. Uh, in some cases, they'd be brought out for one was one was brought out for the first time in the 80s, when the writer who had survived took it to a uh, to use as evidence in the trial of, of some uh, uh, Nazi guards. Uh, but in, in, in many so as time has gone on, these things have added enormous depth and, and, and detail and, and breadth to people's understanding of the Holocaust. And because of my connection to Pick, I, I just I felt kind of personally uh, uh, as if I had an opportunity to both you know serve his memory and make a contribution to uh, the general uh, literature. And so uh, once we, we I, once I wrote the essay and it had been accepted for for the for the capstone, uh, I was very gratified to get the help of my primary reader Beth Wenger. Uh, in submitting it for publication, and uh, I'm very pleased to say it has been uh, taken. It, we it, it, we have a, a deal with uh, Indiana University Press to uh, finally publish the the Pick Diary. Um, I don't know when exactly publishers seem to move at their own pace, but uh, I'm quite excited to uh, uh, see it gets wider circulation, and and particularly you know, not just for uh, I mean in a general sense for scholars who don't have access to the Hebrew. Which is, you know, most people. I mean, outside of Israel, there aren't that many uh, researchers who, who are that familiar with um, primary languages, uh, and particular in, in Lithuania itself, because Lithuania, uh, like a lot of places in Eastern Europe, has wrestled with its own history, uh, particularly regarding the Holocaust. Uh, it's it. There's been an ongoing kind of dialogue within the country, politically and among scholars to try to come to grips with what happened there. And to this day, there are very, very bitter and sometimes, uh, you know, almost violent uh, disputes between people who uh, take the view that the Lithuanians were terribly, terribly guilty and those who claim that the, the Lithuanians themselves were victims of the Nazis. Uh, and the truth, of course, is way more complicated than I've just, than either of those positions. Uh, but I, my hope is that this this document, this uh, journal diary, once it gets out there, will find an audience among uh, people who are engaged in that discussion and that dialogue, and that we'll make a contribution. So that's basically it, and I'll be happy to uh, provide more information if anyone has questions. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Well, getting that published will be really exciting. Uh, as you said, it will add to the available literature. Hopefully your footnotes and your introduction will also help guide people to think about how to approach this document. Uh, that's really fascinating and fabulous. Um, so it's great for you and Professor Winger to really push that sort of ball uh, down the court. 
I guess one question I have is you mentioned that part of your essay in your introduction was to situate this in the broader context of other diaries and argue for its particular value in adding to the conversation and our understanding of the Holocaust. What are maybe one or two of the takeaways you have that you could leave us as to why Pick's diary is particularly interesting? Well, I, I, I think partly is, as I alluded before, he had a, a particular orientation given his grounding in traditional Jewish text and thought and his medical background. So he, is, he provides this sort of interesting combination of someone who can look at, the, at, the, at what is happening around him uh, both with a, a fairly you know, modern scientific attitude uh, and, and he's very, he's very uh, journalistic almost, especially we, we, towards the end when he's, he's recounting the news of, of what they're hearing about the, about the war. I mean, when, when the Germans are beaten in Stalingrad and the Russians begin their advance, uh, all, it, I mean, just, it, 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 it may come as news to a lot of people that all this was was not was what all this information was finding its way into this uh, ghetto. They weren't they, they were isolated in many respects, but they had a lot of information, a lot of sources. And he he's he he was able to uh, partly there was a, there was I learned, as I learned through my research, there was a, uh, a hidden transistor or, or hidden radio you know, that someone had and who would recount what had happened. So he, he, he in his diary, he'll say things like, well, Hitler gave a speech last night. He doesn't call him Hitler. He uses a variety of biblical uh, allusions that describe him as mm. the, the father of all evil, uh, and the various other names. Uh, he describes him as the Satan in various guises. Uh, but it, but when but I was I was kind of stunned when I was doing the research because he would describe a, 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 a hearing of a Hitler speech and, I, and there would be a date and I would. Wonder, I, said, I wonder if I could find out what was actually said. I went to the New York Times uh, archives and not only did the New York Times report on the speech, they had the text in the same day or the, you know, within a day or two. And so I was able to kind of you know, link those two and, and, and footnote it and annotate what he was, exactly what he was referring to. Um, so there's this kind of very detailed journalistic uh, approach. And there's also, uh, again, this, this kind of uh, almost theological, I don't know, uh, uh, the view of things in which he, he just he talks about, you know, how they, how the Jew, how the Jews are being punished and, or how they, how they, how they've been suffering and what the, he also has a, a, a particular attitude because he was a very ardent Zionist and he constantly is talking about how uh, the only solution in the future, once this horror is ended is for we Jews to, you know, go uh, populate our own land. He, he, had, he had been active in that cause throughout the 20s and 30s when the, wow. when the population of the Jewish population of Palestine was growing and they were beginning to lay the foundations for the future state, which he unfortunately never lived to see, but his son did. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's all that, all those, all those different points of view and all the other diaries that are out there, the major ones, uh, you know, have their own points of view. None of this, none of this say that his is superior, but it's, it, is, it is distinctive. And I think it belongs in that canon. So that's interesting because I was going to ask you why his journal was written in Hebrew, seeing as he had that modern scientific education, medical education, probably in French. And he lived at a period when Lithuania had gotten its independence from Russia, um, at, you know, in the teens and 20s, thereabouts, you know, back and forth. Um, right. Do you think his interest in writing in Hebrew was not just because of the yeshiva education, but because he was a Zionist? I was I, I'm sure that, that had, I, I'm sure that was okay. part of it. That yes, he he, and and you, it's it's completely speculative, but one can imagine that yes, in one sense, he 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 was uh, providing an ex example. It was he was he was enacting what he assumed to be you know the the future course. Although very interestingly, he has a passage in there. When he's musing about, you know, maybe at some point if I survive this, we'll go to Israel, or we'll go to Palestine, and and there I'm going to have to learn English, because if you recall, the the British were in charge there. Yeah. So he's it, it, he's very multilingual all the way along. Mm -hmm. um, he, he obviously had, he spoke Yiddish and Hebrew and Russian and Lithuanian and French, 
And, and he, I think that, and that was part of his identity. He, he, he saw himself, you can tell the personality of the man emerges from this thing. And he, he, he was quite, a, uh, quite proud of his educational accomplishments, it, almost conceited if you read this thing in some ways. Right. He, yeah. he was not, he, he, had a, he, had a, he had a rather, he was proud of himself. Yeah, and that, it's great that, that you know, in something so grim with a, a story that sort of, you know, doesn't come uh, to a good end for, for Aaron, but maybe does for his son and his, his descendants, um, that a sense of his identity and his sense of his own purpose and worth yeah. is, is there in that document. So that's great to share. Yeah. I think, and I, and that's, I think this is, that's the nature of these kinds of things is they all take this horrible uh, period of time, which we've seen in movies and, and, mm -hmm. and read about in, you know, in, in, in stories that give you the broad outline, but they provide, when you get down to these individual human experiences and points of view, it, it, it really gives you a, a much more granular, it, it changes the way you think about it. Okay. Hey, one of our uh, uh, current students, Mike Blackwell, asked um, how the work you've done in the diaries impacted you personally in any way. Me personally, uh, well, I, I feel incredibly enriched by the experience, uh, both of uh, working through uh, this translation. I mean, I feel like I've, I've, I've begun to understand a little bit more deeply what translation is. I mean, I, 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 I took, I, I, I began studying Yiddish quite a number of years ago and um, in order to read my grandfather's writings. And I've done some translating. Um, this was a different level of translating because it 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 just involved so much, uh, so, so, so a, a more difficult and problematic language. I mean, to to take a, a an idiom that might have made sense or had a particular emotional, uh, you know, kind of color, in the context of the his Hebrew world, and make that into an English. Uh, idiom, or make that into something that makes some makes sense to a current reader. It, that was just uh, it was hugely challenging, and and I, I feel like you know it, it's an accomplishment. So I'm 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 quite glad I did it, and uh, I've since done a little more uh, some other projects related related projects that it's definitely helped me in that regard. And just getting to doing the research in in the in the period and working with Beth. And some of the other professors that I had there, uh, Ben Nathans and David Ruderman, and uh, some of the others, it was, it was, it was just the whole thing was terrifically uh, enriching. I'm really glad I did it. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed your time, and I, I'm glad you really produced this excellent uh, capstone, and that it's going to actually see itself out in print soon. So you'll just keep us posted. Sure. So we know when that hits uh, hits the press. Yeah. Well, thanks. Good uh, signings. <laughs> um, our next speaker. I'm going to invite on board is Rand Holman. He's the head of the upper school at Doan Academy, a small independent school in Burlington, New Jersey. His work's based on his love for film. Yours as an educator and experience managing the viewing habits of his seven and 10 year old sons. His capstone is called Breaking the Frame, a cinema studies based English curriculum designed for media, media literacy benchmarks. Rand. Thank you. I'll uh, get this presented and then I'll start working through it. And I, I probably should have said poorly managing the, the viewing habits of my sons. <laughs> the pandemic has not been kind in that regard, but that's okay. We'll talk more about why that's such a problem. Okay. Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, I am Rand Holman, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking to you about this, just to, to talk a little bit first about the MLA program and how it impacted me. Um, it was perfect for the sort of collision of ideas and cross-curricular work that I needed to do to really do this project well, to create a, a high school level curriculum, a middle and high school level curriculum around uh, cinema studies. Um, and it really modeled, I think, what ultimately I want for all my students and, and particularly through this curriculum, which is considering ideas uh, across content areas. And so it really, whether it was film courses that helped me consider an aspect of film history differently, or um, courses on terrorism that helped me understand radicalization and how visual media contributes to that, um, all those collisions were, were hugely important. So 
Let me see if I can get it to change. All right. So let me see if I can get the thing to go here. If you need me to show the slides for you, we can try that as well. Okay, I'll give it one more shot, as I said, and I can also maybe even click through without, uh, I can just click through on the side. Are you able to see them change now? Yep. Okay, I'll just mm -hmm. skip the full screen. So sort of my agenda, I'll talk through sort of why I came to build this curriculum, which, which my capstone project really turned into a full uh, lesson plan detailed curriculum uh, with an essay backing up the why behind it. Um, and I'll talk about why it's so important um, the passivity that I think is present in young people right now around visual media, um, and then actually walk through the curriculum. And you can see the thesis there um, that really students must learn how to analyze visual media in order to navigate the sophisticated la landscape in which we live. This has been told to us by as far back at least as Howard Beale here in 1976 from Network railing against the television and saying, it, you, you people better get it together or we're going to be in real trouble here. So I took his uh, words as, as gospel as I went through this um, and took the words of George Lucas, right, as, as gospel, which I think he captured here with, you know, today we work with the written or spoken word as the primary form of communication, but we also need to understand the importance of graphics, music, and cinema, which are just as powerful and in some way more deeply entwined with young people's culture. Um, and, and we have to make them as sophisticated in those forms of communication, not just the written word. And I think you could add to that list, as we'll see, you know, YouTube, online videos, TikTok, all of the social media platforms that are, that are so present in our lives. So the sort of why now, why is this so important? And really it's about how young people are navigating the world and consuming information. I am an English teacher originally by trade. Nothing would please me more than widespread reading, but realistically, you can see in that data that, that you know, the number of seniors who are reading uh, actively outside of, of social media and the internet has dropped tremendously over, you know, the last 40, 50 years. Uh, meanwhile, our teens are logging an average of seven and a half hours of screen time a day. Um, and video is just getting more and more dominant on the internet. So the ways in which they're getting information are uh, is increasingly through visual means. Um, and, and the thing that's wild about this, of course, is that these statistics are pre-pandemic. And um, I will not go on and on about my kids, but let me just say the dynamic of working from home while needing them to be quiet has increased their YouTube watching much more than I would like. And I think that's true at kind of every age level uh, as we had to sort of recede into our technology and away from, from person to person interaction. Um, so that leaves us with some really urgent needs and high stakes. Um, we are in a space right now where, and this work by Rebecca Lewis on alternative influence was hugely helpful to me here, um, where there are all kinds of online pathways and visual media pathways uh, towards radicalization that are well-constructed um, and involve cross-pollination of figures purporting themselves to be authorities on a subject, you know, alt-right figures who sort of collaborate to lend each other their credibility. Um, and the risks are really real if you're not aware of how visual media can, can manipulate uh, the viewer. Um, similarly, or connected to it, is this idea that a lot of young people see content as just in existence, as existing on the internet as if it sort of organically grew there. You know, they walk by information on the internet sometimes as if you're walking by a, a tree. You know, you're just like, I, I don't know how it got there, but it's always been there, I'm sure. Um, and instead, we really need them to understand that content is created intentionally um, by companies, by people with specific designs. Um, uh, we all see that in the sort of Apple news feed that appears on so many of our phones. That's easy to say, oh, the news. Well, uh, it's not the news. It's the news curated by someone somewhere. Um, and it's awfully hard to pinpoint exactly who. Um, and from a, a curriculum standpoint, um, we really don't teach active visual media analysis skills in a really defined way. Sometimes you can get that in college um, when you maybe get to a cinema studies curriculum. I uh, got a cinema studies minor at Penn uh, in 2004, and I don't think there was a major at the time. And I think I might've been one of the first classes where there was eligible to be a minor. Meanwhile, most film study in uh, the middle and high school levels are really just an extension of English curriculum. Um, meaning that they're studied for their narrative structure and meaning 
but not sort of specifically studied for how the actual visuals Alert are from constructed. Calendar. No food after 6 p.m. Clear. Oh, are we good? All right. <laughs> um, and it leads to ultimately there's an ingrained passivity on the part of our young people where they are really consuming all this content without an active stance, not necessarily recognizing the intentionality of the mise-en-scene and cinematography, right? You can see, you know, uh, an image here from a Wes Anderson drawing uh, for, for his movies, which are famously constructed in terms of every detail that appears on screen, or a shot from Hitchcock here uh, from Vertigo, where that really evokes an emotion, the way that's shot, the way it's framed, the, the long shot, the fact that it's deep focus, it affects you in so many different ways, but it's really important that you're aware of that. And it's particularly important because um, Hollywood filmmakers have for so long developed strategies to be invisible, right? So editing, for instance, is designed for you not to notice it. Um, it's, it's the way it's done in a, a typical Hollywood movie by and large is so that you can be immersed in the story, be affected emotionally by the story, depending on the nature of the film, even be manipulated by the story without being aware of that. Um, the same is true, of course, for, for heightened and immersive sound and music, right? Music affects us so deeply, but by and large, we're sort of trained not to think of it. Uh, you might think some of you who, who have seen an old comedy classic, um, you know, there's a great scene in like Blazing Saddles where they're riding through the desert and they come across the piano actually playing the music that you hear. You know, calling attention to that kind of, of construction is so important. And I mentioned this, but seeing documentaries as inherently authoritative, as a delivery of facts, because often the rhetorical positions that are used are actually obscured uh, and hidden in a way that can be really dangerous if you're passive, really interesting and valuable if you're active. That passivity extends to creativity. Um, we love to think of ourselves as living in a sort of creative revolution for young people because of the tools they have at their disposal, but they're doing a lot of watching uh, and uh, a lot of uh, scrolling, but not necessarily a lot of building. Uh, some of you, if you have kids, may have seen the recent movie, The Mitchells vs. the Machines, where there is a young person who's totally obsessed with creating and dynamic. We want more of that, and it's concerning that we're not seeing it. And then some analytical goals that I have then to sort of respond to those problems. Make the invisible visible, like wake up students, show them what's done intentionally, teach them the terminology and names uh, that they'll need to define what's happening in visual media, see systems and semiotics, be aware of the corporate interest, interests that influence creative decisions and the content we consume, which is massively affected representation, something like the Hayes Code, where only certain types of, of couples were shown on screen, only certain types of romances, um, where, for instance, you, to reference the shot there from Philadelphia, you know, uh, members of the queer community were completely marginalized and taken out of film by the Hayes Code after being much more present, actually, in the 1930s. And then using film to really see the sort of cultural collisions and history over the last hundred years of our country and to dig into that. I have some creative goals that were, you know, at the heart of the curriculum. Uh, deepen that understanding through project-based learning, build the analytical skills by actually getting to play with stuff, um, forefront and celebrate identity um, by breaking the frame, you know, turning students into visual storytellers, which they already are, uh, though not, as I said a minute ago, as much as we want, um, allows them to bring who they are and their lived experiences and their uh, earned literacies into the classroom and allows them to practice restoring, um, retelling stories in ways that counter um, sort of dominant narratives um, and create a, a, a compelling counter narrative. And um, I found really helpful uh, some work called Rethinking Composing in a Digital Age um, by three authors, Vasudevan, Schultz, and Bateman. You'll see this in my work cited at the end. And then also that, that restoring idea, uh, really compelling stuff by um, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Amy Stornalio, um, who uh, I think are both still pen professors. Um, or certainly were very recently. Um, and then I think inherent, there's huge opportunities I mentioned because of the time period film is covered to build social justice goals into a curriculum of this kind as well and use film to discuss important issues of social justice and injustice. And that's important both because we have a moral obligation as educators um, and because the subject matter lends itself to it, but also because it's what students want. These are the conversations 
that they want to have. Um, in my role as an administrator, you know, the days of getting uh, student government proposals about um, another vending machine are, are fairly over for me. I, I get really much more interesting proposals about, say, how we need to adjust our history curriculum to be more inclusive, um, which is a much more compelling conversation than Doritos. Um, so I wanted to take a minute then and walk through the units. Um, it's important to say that I chose specific films, but in the actual curriculum, which is detailed by like lesson plan level, um, I included a lot of choose your own adventure options there, hopefully for educators who want to teach a different age level or choose a different film or take a different tack. But um, I organized these units by just saying, hopefully quickly, sort of a connection to that analytical goal, to the creative goal and the social justice goal. So classic Hollywood narrative structure, uh, things like Toy Story and Star Wars. Um, how do you recognize that structure that's so consistent and ingrained in almost all the movies that we watch have the same pretty exact structure, even though the stories can be so different. Help students see um, and capture that power through infographics, start them thinking about being visual storytellers and really consider how the rigidity of the Hollywood story structure has connected to a lack of representation over time. Um, there's a reason financially um, that the protagonist in Star Wars is a white male with blonde hair. There's a reason why a movie, to go back to my last slide, like Black Panther felt so revolutionary um, because it broke the idea that economically you couldn't include a cast of almost entirely uh, black characters. Um, so mise-en-scene is next, um, which is everything you see on screen, basically, or I should say everything you see in a theater, right? The, the acting, lighting, props, costumes, and makeup, set and setting. You see it on screen, but it's also, uh, originally a theater term, and it's often how, how we communicate meaning uh, on screen. It's the most connected to literary study. You know, symbols in literature are very much metaphorical props um, when you do mise-en-scene. Um, it also allows us, I think, creatively to see how we create meaning in our own lives through mise-en-scene. You know, what is your favorite metaphorical prop? What's the item that you find symbolic value in? Um, I have above me um, a, a replica of the Maltese Falcon, which is maybe the most famous in film history. And it's a real opportunity through, ultimately in the curriculum I'm teaching now, actually at the school I work at, I'm teaching this full curriculum over the course of a year um, to dig into the past, present, and future experiences of Black Americans. And we'll be looking at Black Panther and do the right thing as the movies that help sort of guide that conversation about equity and the lack thereof and, and the battle for equity. Um, cinematography, how images are composed and constructed. Um, that is where film editing and actually creating films of our own will really start to come into the curriculum. Um, and really in exciting ways, use video, video editing software. We'll be looking at the social justice theme of, of that unit is, really the difference how men and women are portrayed in film that came directly out of a Mars and Venus at the movies course that I took as part of my MLA program that challenged me to think about that. And Vertigo um, or Rear Window, I chose Rear Window by Hitchcock, um, are really outstanding examples of movies about the male gaze. And when we wanna talk to young people and particularly young men about toxic masculinity and how it got here and why it exists, I think it is critical to talk to them about the visual constructions that they've seen their whole lives, that we've seen their whole lives that create that kind of dynamic. Then we'll get to editing, learn how to sequence images and how, how filmmakers sequence and paste images to create emotions and create a sense of space and time. Practice that again in the films that we make and films that we actually seen, uh, um, film, scenes that we actually film. And, uh, and then look at particularly uh, the evolution of queer characters on screen and through storytelling, uh, my main movie there in the current one I'm teaching is The Hours, um, and really look at the Hayes Co's Code as part of that, and really grapple with the history on screen of queer characters as often devious or aberrant, particularly from like 1930 to the early 2000s. When you get to movies like The Hours, um, Transamerica, Philadelphia, you get a real branching out of what it can mean um, to tell stories about the queer community or, or from and hear stories from the queer community. And then sound. Um, look at the heightened and constructed nature of sound and the power of music. Um, revisit previous films creatively and add sound effects. I'm really excited with the lesson where they get to come in with like, you know, things they bring from home to make sound effects, um, be Foley artists. Um, and we start to move towards documentary by looking at uh, Food Inc. or another movie about uh, or documentary about sustainability. 
to dig into how sound has such an impact on how you see that. Food Inc. sells itself to you as, um, it's a really compelling documentary, but it sells itself to you as basically just the facts. Unless you recognize the cinematography and unless you look at the, the, the sound, and then much earlier than the film tells you, you see, oh, there's something else going on here. And then we really dig in straight into documentaries where students get to actually choose a social justice focus, find a matching documentary from a list, and then work in small groups to explore, analyze those documentaries, consider rhetorical positions um, and storytelling modes and the ways in which authority is built. Right now, as I mentioned, I'm teaching this as a full year course, but my goal in the long term um, is to uh, in, integrate it into uh, middle and high school curriculum. This really, ultimately, this kind of work needs to go is all the way down um, into the lower school levels um, and really young people who are consuming so much video. But certainly the idea was to create six units that combine together, but also could be used, um, split up and integrated into English curricula uh, in order to build the skill set over time, um, which goes to my long-term goals. I'm teaching it now at the school where I work. I hope to convince our English department to transition to some version of that ninth through 12th or sixth through seventh through 12th model. And then ultimately I wanna present this, you know, advocate for it nationally. I think this is a desperate need, not just in English, but that's where my expertise lies. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we can, as soon as possible, give our young people the tools they need to navigate a visual media landscape that's really impacting them in profound ways. And I think that's the gist of it. Nice, Rand. That's really fascinating. I know that, you know, as you were going through the program and taking courses, you mentioned Mars and Venus. I think you were in a tourism course with Vlad Todorov, who's a, a filmmaker and an educator here, um, but that you were thinking about this from a curricular point of view. Uh, and that's always kind of interesting to me because we have had a lot, uh, quite a few MLA students who were administrators or teachers at varying levels, whether we're talking secondary, um, higher ed, or in elementary school, and they didn't pursue a G something at GSE or one of the uh, normal uh, MSED kind of things because they really wanted to take what they were doing and bring it right into the classroom. Uh, and, and this is interesting because you didn't just want to bring ideas into a classroom or teaching. You recognized or, or identified a need in what you think your students are have as a deficiency in their education and are trying to shape something that's going to change the way they're educated, which I think is really fascinating. Um, Tell me a little bit about how you decided that, that they were missing something now. Did you think about that before the MLA or did it come to you as you took classics? Yeah, it was an idea that I certainly had from being an English teacher before I moved into a more administrative role. And I really, I started teaching films and I just enjoyed it so much. I love the study of films and the way it lets students write. There's a lot to enjoy about it that's, that's not necessarily connected to this need. Um, and a lot of it was born of my lived experiences, but also the conversations I had with young people about what they wanted to discuss with real intellectual power and, and intent. You know, and I would love to have students read um, the works of Charles Dickens over a summer, but is that more or less valuable than watching all five seasons of The Wire? Probably not. Um, and yet the skills that they need to analyze The Wire, think about it, a good example of a really compelling, brilliant show that has some gender equity issues, for example, they don't have those skills. And I, I sort of start to really feel that. Um, and I think, again, with my own children, but also uh, seeing the way the nation changed and the way social media began to work um, and the political landscape, it just sort of, the issues weren't that students were being manipulated in so much by what they read. Uh, I think I started to really feel they were being uh, and not just students, you know, put a, a, a stray by what they watched. Um, and so I entered the capstone, you know, I entered the, the MLA program with a thought that I wanted to develop this curriculum, but certainly the ways in which the, the program lined up allowed me to tailor, uh, 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 to, you know, uh, my studies to the different things I needed. Um, the digital literacies course I took through the Graduate School of Education was so important for me from a building curriculum standpoint. And I would not have been able to write the essay um, and really have the research components without that course. It was, it was completely necessary. The film courses I took on food and film, on uh, Mars and Venus, the movies were really important. And the, the, you know, the terrorism course you mentioned, but even the, the King Arthur course I took and was lucky to be in with, with Emily and Robert, you know, ultimately what I looked at through that was 
kind of World War II and propaganda. And, and again, it, it allowed me to sort of try and put these pieces together and say, these students are constantly watching this, you know, this kind of content and their awareness of how it's built is just not there. Um, at, or at least it's not there at a middle and high school level. And as I said, unfortunately, the hours of YouTube watching my sons have already logged at age seven and 10 is, I need to teach them this, I don't know, at age five, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, Amy Allen, one of our attendees, um, current student asked, said, A, your curriculum looks great. And she wanted to know how do your you find your students receiving it so far? Uh, have there been any unexpected responses from that? Um, I'm not far into it, I must say, but I also think that there's real excitement that the curriculum is meeting them where they're at in terms of their interests. And I think we all remember moments where things that we thought were cool, but didn't think were intellectual, we learned were also intellectual. So I very intentionally started with, you know, we start with Toy Story um, and Star Wars A New Hope and Black Panther before we get to do the right thing, in part because it helps them see what's at play, but also how much intellectual power they can find there. So it's an elective right now. So I'm not there with having to convince the, the masses, but, but I was able to persuade some students to like fill a spot in their schedule with it. And so far it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been really exciting. I really can't wait to see um, how they react to the creative part of the course. And I'm curious about how I might be able to get that creative piece earlier in the course. I'm aware that sort of like halfway through when you, you get there. Um, but so far, um, really positive responses. I'm also really curious and have generally gotten positive responses so far, but I have to be mindful of the fact that these teachers technically, like I am kind of their boss, so it's hard to give them an idea and see, <laughs> see if they, what they really, really think. But, um, but I think the other piece is it's gonna require English teachers to build a skill set and expand their skill set. And so I'm really interested to see how I can convince them of the power of this and also the joy and excitement they can find in it. Um, I think it will be very doable, but it is notable that, um, you know, if I'm successful, multiple teachers at my school will have some notable PD work to do over the summer um, to take their current really outstanding literary analysis skills and just graph them onto this other set of terminology. Right, right. Um, uh, Scott Singerson asked, uh, said, great presentation, pedagogical ideas. Do you incorporate the role of editing as an applied lesson in any of your uh, courses? Because um, editing seems like a linchpin in this conversation. Yeah, so there's a whole unit on editing and um, and I really am excited to teach the hours as part of it, which you have, haven't happened to see that movie. It's not um, as well known as some of the other ones in the curriculum. It's just edited in a really compelling and powerful way and kind of was a novel I didn't think was was adaptable, but they edited it in a way that it's possible. But yeah, so we'll go through continuity editing um, and disjunctive editing, the things you can do to, to break the editing rhythm. And the students will, will film scenes and will create camera coverage and ultimately practice using those. So I'll say, you need to edit this together using the software in a way that's clear and creates a sense of space and time. But I want you to pick a couple moments and I want you to be disjunctive. I want you to pick an ellipsis to include, or I want you to, um, to break the 180 degree line so that it's disorienting for the for the viewer. And of course to them, a lot of the content they've consumed is doing a lot of that stuff all the time because it's happened more and more um, in film history. Um, and our ability to run with it has gotten a lot better. Um, but yes, so we'll really uh, dig into that, uh, I hope um, in, in a lot of depth, both analytically, um, but also, um, you know, and show clips like the classic Bonnie and Clyde clip of that kind of editing, give them a sense of that history, show them. Uh, I think I think it might be the big sleep is sort of your classic, like you want to see continuity editing just done so, but then empower them to say, you know, break this up um, and and show them how it creates emotion. You know, the, the beginning of Top Gun, right, is slow editing with slow music and then the music hits and all of a sudden it's bang, 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 bang. And it does something to you. And I, I'm excited for them to sort of see what it is that's driving that emotional force. Cool. Hey, one thing that popped into my head is really since you started the MLA, because it's been a couple of years, um, there have been some interesting changes even just in the social media and media realm with like the explosion of TikTok. With mm -hmm. the number of students say that you have or, or youngsters like my kids 
moving along from the more static um, sort of reception of Instagram postings and Facebook and all that, they've ejected that and moved into the world where they're all creators of TikTok in these tiny but rather carefully mapped out and, and highly artificial TikTok posts that they make. Sometimes just for a couple of friends, others go on to a bigger audience. Do you see maybe students' use of social media being the kind of thing that could actually, A, reinforce the need for them to understand visual uh, um, environment that they live in, but also do you think it, it might make some of your students more receptive to wanting this to be part of their curriculum? I definitely think so. And I'm really curious to see where the students take me and force me to go. Uh, I do not understand or use TikTok. I do understand the premise, but I don't have the expertise to do it. But I think something that's true in education increasingly is, and if you want to be cross-curricular, like the MLA program, is you've got to get comfortable dealing with technology that you don't know how to use. If you, if you say, I'm either going to learn everything I need to or I'm gonna tell kids you can't use this because I don't know how to use it, you're gonna miss huge educational opportunities or never sleep because you can't keep up. And so I think that's, I, I, I will be excited if the students say, I hope they'll say, ooh, these editing techniques actually are sort of what I'm already doing on TikTok or I can make it even better, you know, TikTok a, a, out of this, um, you know, by, by understanding this concept. But I, I'm hoping they'll kind of push me in, in that direction and certainly, I hope that they'll understand immediately social media better. To use an example, I think is really important, and I, I mentioned already. Um, not if you're using Instagram or TikTok and you don't understand how the gender dynamics of the camera have historically worked and how they impact what you see and how you ultimately view the world, you are, I think, not going to be the the person you ultimately want to be. You'll not be the best version of yourself because it is really profound. And it still really exists. Uh, the last thing I'll say, say and answer is I don't know if they'll buy this connection, but I chose Rear Window because I think it's a perfect uh, representation of Instagram. <laughs> That's my favorite part of it is one of the projects will be to take all the different characters he watches out the window and make them Instagram feeds and be like, what is Miss Torso's Instagram feed? And what is, uh, you know, the, the piano player's Instagram feed? And um, so hopefully we'll be able to make those connections and that students will drive me to make those connections because um, I turned 40 a couple of weeks ago and it's just, it's all getting away from me fast. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rand. Our next speaker is Simon Graylika. He's a junior fellow with the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation. His research is at the intersection of IT, warfare, international relations, privacy and great power competition. His capstone is applicability to the privacy security dilemma in international relations. Samyak, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, let me try sharing my screen. Just give me a second. Um, drag down the bottom. You should see the banner come up, a little green box. Uh, just give me one second. Oh, it's asking me to uh, quit and reopen Zoom, so I might have to join in again. Um, do you want me to try and share my screen and you can just tell me when to advance? Sure, that sounds better. Yeah, let's do that. Let me see if I can, I'm gonna open up your PowerPoint, share my screen. Hold on a second. Okay, let me. Okay, can you see the slides? Yup, but uh, there's something covering half the slide. Yeah, that's good. That okay. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope my uh, you guys enjoy my capstone because uh, it took a lot of mental effort to get here and it certainly helped me a lot since then. Uh, Chris, if you could go to the next slide. 
So uh, basically a little bit about my path to get to the capstone project. So in high school, I studied commerce with IP and I was a topper in IP and I was, but I was very unsure about a career in IT. I was very interested in international relations. Uh, so what that I ended up doing was two separate bachelors, one in IT in cybersecurity and another in political science. For me, the MLA was a way to make these two meet and talk to each other because these two disciplines uh, really don't, uh, except for very limited interactions that I've seen them have. Uh, so uh, the curriculum that I took was uh, was vast and included uh, courses in uh, public policy, for example, public administration, uh, also international studies uh, at the Lauder Institute, but uh, a chunk of my coursework was in the political science department, uh, especially courses like uh, international political economy and security studies that I've taken with uh, Jason Davis and uh, uh, Michael Horowitz uh, in the semester preceding my capstone, certainly helped influence that. Uh, but more than just that, I think it was uh, the strategic news cycle at the time. Uh, this was, uh, I think, early 2021. Uh, the pandemic had hit a couple of months ago, and uh, there was talk about a changing WhatsApp privacy policy, which was going to impact a lot of people around the world, but not EU citizens, for example. Uh, then there was the Genoa data leak where uh, the People's Republic of China was allegedly caught uh, surveilling a lot of citizens abroad. I think it was a couple of million uh, people. And uh, they were using attitudinal profiling techniques to basically uh, use their data to, uh, to basically understand how to influence opinions. So uh, one of the important uh, objectives of my capstone was how do I break these interdisciplinary silos because uh, feels like privacy, security, IT and I uh, don't really talk to each other, but many a times they talk about the same things. Uh, and I think uh, this capstone has certainly helped me because ever since then, at least in my current job, one reason why I got the job was the capstone. And more than just that, uh, I have published uh, a lot of uh, pieces related to the capstone on uh, specific topics that I've taken from the capstone published with my current employer. And I think that has certainly helped me uh, in taking forward my career professionally. Could you go to the next slide, please, Chris? So the premise of my capstone, uh, if I had to talk about it a little bit, is the privacy security dilemma. Uh, to the uninitiated, it basically means that security and privacy in the online sphere have an inverse relationship, meaning any increase in security will lead to a decrease in, in user privacy and vice versa, which is uh, the primary driver for state surveillance behavior. Uh, we see this manifest in legislation such as the Patriot Act, which was enacted in the US uh, after the 2001 terrorist attacks. Uh, but when it comes to international relations, the situation gets a little more murky uh, because within a society, uh, privacy is a right conferred upon citizens by the state, right? But increasingly what we've seen is cross-border digital surveillance. And uh, we, have we have seen that data being used to uh, undermine the sovereignty of states. For example, through the 2016 election interference by Russia. Uh, and a base the four basic elements of a state when they are threatened, which is the permanent population, permanent borders, international recognition and sovereignty, the state will react more strongly as opposed to when a right of a citizen is targeted. Uh, but more than just that, uh, I think it's to do with the fact that it does not apply 
in recent times more and more because of the rise of surveillance capitalism as a business model, as well as a change in the nature of warfare. Uh, foreign states today have an increasing interest in the personal data and metadata of foreign citizens. Um, and But this is not uh, uniform for all states. It really depends on what uh, what is the level of development of their domestic technology industries, if they can offer any alternatives or not. Um, and I, I will be using the Wallerstein world system to basically uh, analyze that in addition to painting the picture of why it, the nature of warfare and the nature of the global internet business has changed. To go to the next slide, please, Chris. Yeah, so surveillance capitalism was a concept that was uh, propagated by Shoshana Zuboff of Harvard Business School. Basically, the idea behind it is that modern internet companies do not care so much about getting money through selling services, but more about getting user data or what she describes as waste data, which is basically metadata processes, processing it, uh, making behavioral products out of it and selling it in the futures market. Uh, but now it's been taken forward as she describes as this also involves uh, modification of user behavior. Uh, companies like Facebook and Google have admitted, for example, that they can change voter preferences on the basis of uh, this data. Uh, and this is, according to Zuboff, the dominant business model across the world in uh, internet technology companies. Uh, another important facet of this is how uh, the nature of warfare has changed. So the goal of all kinds of warfare is to impose one's political will on one's adversary. So in the first generation of warfare, there was person-to-person -person conflict in a face-to-face -face manner with the determinants were physical strength, skills, and numbers. Uh, so you could see this as two groups going head to head at war with one another. Uh, with the invention of the long bow, which in eventually turned into firepower, uh, balances of power changed and uh, a, a weaker adversary could take on a stronger adversary now because of uh, the way uh, these wars were fought, and also the distance between the adversaries also increased. Uh, the third generation of warfare was uh, was uh, uh, in between the First and Second World War by the Germans. It was invented, uh, which focused on maneuver and infiltration behind enemy lines to basically impose one's will. And this was followed by the fourth generation of warfare, which blurred the lines between soldiers and civilians, the border regions and the hinterland, uh, with state-sponsored terrorism and proxy warfare becoming dominant and uh, being the primary methods to impose one's will on one's adversity. Uh, fifth generation warfare is something that uh, a couple of theorists have talked about, uh, but what, what it basically means is uh, sort of what uh, Rand talked about, uh, propaganda, the war of narratives and perceptions, uh, to change perceptions according to uh, mass media, through mass media and through basically influencing opinions through that phase. But sixth generation warfare takes these developments in surveillance capitalism uh, uh, using the mass data collected by such firms and the behavioral analytics of these firms. It aims to implement what uh, theorists have called reflexive control, which is basically uh, making your adversary or the target undertake particular predetermined actions on the basis of your design by feeding them particular information. Uh, this is more individualized targeting. And an important function behind this is uh, user data. The more amount of user data an adversary has, 
uh, the greater the reflexivity the adversary has upon the target. So reflexivity is basically the ability to impose reflexive control on the adversary. If you could go to the next slide, please, Chris. So over here, there is another dilemma which emerges, uh, which I call the two master dilemma. So basically, there is an increase in uh, data user sharing legislation and government programs. So for example, the US PRISM program uh, includes the largest US tech giants, including Microsoft, Google, uh, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon, which all share user data with the uh, National Security Agency of the US. Uh, similarly, the People's Republic of China's national intelligence law compels all uh, PRC companies to share, uh, to assist in uh, intelligence operations of their uh, intelligence agencies, uh, foreign intelligence operations. So basically what this has resulted in is that companies now have to serve two roles. First, that of profits uh, of profit seeking corporations responsible to their shareholders. And secondly, as national security assets responsible to the government. Uh, we have seen the importance of this user data. Uh, so General Michael Hayden once, for example, said, uh, we kill people based on metadata. Uh, there have been uh, various quotes by various intelligence officials, at least in the US. Uh, ranging from 80 to 90 percent, sometimes even going up to 95 percent of how many requests are actually taken care of through the prison program. Uh, in this case, states would need, uh, if they want to reduce their foreign reflexivity, have both offensive and defensive options. In this sense, we can look at things like data protection, localization, data sharing, and indigenization as means to reduce foreign reflexivity by reducing the ability of foreign states to collect data on one's own citizens, and basically to restrict their ability to impose reflexive control on one's state. Uh, similarly, in the offensive realm, promotions of one, promotion of one's uh, tech firms abroad or cooperating or in more serious cases, compelling uh, one's tech firms to share user data with share state agencies. Uh, and that's specifically about foreign user data, not uh, domestic user data. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what I'll be using here is the Wallerstein world system. Uh, this system basically divides the world into three, the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery. Uh, the core are the states, uh, which I call the superpowers. Basically, these are the states that exploit the periphery uh, and to a certain extent, the semi-periphery for their resources and sell their goods. Uh, uh, the peripheral states are the ones that are exploited and do not have the ability to produce goods or export them. Uh, and the semi-peripheral states are somewhere in the middle, uh, Wallerstein says they can be looked at either as peripheral states uh, trying to move up a notch or core states in decline. Uh, and another important facet of this is the hierarchy of control. Uh, this basically describes how technology services in the present world operate with the data collection. So at the bottom of the pyramid are like plugins, mods, extension hacks. These are the, the, the lowest tier of technology services in the sense that if a browser wants, uh, it can basically stop its data collection in a second. Above that are websites, which again are uh, beholden to the browser, but they can show you as, as much code as they like. Uh, the browser, like any other app, is beholden to the operating system, which itself is beholden to network infrastructure. So when we talk about things like 5G, Huawei 5G infrastructure and the national security threat from it, it emanates from the fact that there is nothing above infrastructure. And this infrastructure doesn't just include uh, physical network devices. It even includes uh, infrastructure services such as content delivery networks, uh, DNS services, so on and so forth. 
basically all network traffic passes through here. It can be stopped, data collection can be enhanced or can be reduced on lower tiers. So if we use this hierarchy of control and we modify this uh, word system to understand the global technology markets and to see how states would react, what we would see is that the core countries would dominate the top tiers of, the, of this pyramid. The semi-periphery will have some top tier uh, elements, but majority of their elements would be in the middle tier of the pyramid and the periphery will not have many domestic alternatives. If you go to the next slide, please, Chris. So what we see here is, uh, and I've taken uh, examples of five different countries, uh, two core, uh, two semi-periphery and one periphery countries. Uh, we see that the core or the superpowers would be would have the ability to engage in global data collection and would want to maintain their global data uh, hegemony because not just because of uh, wanting power but also because of wanting security. If they give up at least one domain, uh, another potential superpower can come in, sweep in, and try to take over that domain. So, for example, when we talk about the US case, this might come up, but when we look at the US ban on TikTok, as we were just discussing uh, a little while ago, or uh, 5G infrastructure from Huawei, uh, we see that uh, uh, a superpower might feel more threatened when a domain that it does not have any kind of domination. And for example, the US did not have much domination in the infrastructure domain, but did have alternatives to things like uh, TikTok and WeChat, uh, they would feel more threatened. And this is evidenced by the fact that the US did, while it banned both uh, Chinese apps as well as Chinese infrastructure, it only launched a global campaign to stop uh, other countries uh, using Chinese infrastructure because it had uh, the ability to provide alternatives in terms of uh, the app domain. So when we look at uh, countries in the core and the superpowers, we see a lot of similar trends, right? Uh, first, we see that uh, the US's PRISM program, for example, resembles very similarly uh, the Chinese national intelligence law. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the US PRISM program is a voluntary program, whereas the national intelligence law of China compels firms to assist in uh, foreign intelligence collection. Uh, similarly, uh, the FISA Act of the US authorizes the Attorney General to uh, authorize basically the collection of foreign user data just without a court mandate. That, that does not apply to US citizens, but that does apply to foreign nationals. Uh, and another important facet of this is uh, the US alliance system. So if we look at uh, the Snowden leaks that happened about a decade ago, uh, we see that the role of the Five Eyes, Nine Eyes, and 14 Eyes alliances, uh, these are intelligence sharing alliances, uh, which basically share all intelligence data. And when we put that in conjunction with, for example, the PRISM program, we see that the US not only has the ability to collect data using its firms, but also it can get access to the data that some of its allies have and uh, is either stored on in their territory or their allies control. Uh, we see that uh, we see that the US, for example, would only took action against uh, big tech firms when not when privacy violations were found because privacy violations against Facebook, Google, and Apple have been known for a very long time. But when they were found to be helping adversaries, so when we look at, for example, the use of Facebook to influence the 2016 elections, or we look at uh, 
Google and uh, Apple cooperating with the Chinese government to uh, build their uh, surveillance infrastructure. We see a violation of that two master dilemma and the US government sort of wants to ensure that these companies stay in line, which is in line with what we assume a superpower to do. Uh, another interesting facet of this was that even when the US banned Huawei network infrastructure, the alternative that it recommended was Ericsson, which is a Swedish based company. And Sweden is a 49 ally of the US. In essence, uh, what that means is while this move reduced uh, China's reflexivity uh, or China's ability to collect user data globally, it increased US reflexivity because US still wanted to maintain its dominance. We see similar behavior in terms of what China does. So I spoke about the national intelligence law, but uh, China is uh, on the defensive side, they have slightly more uh, uh, provision. So for example, uh, because of the great firewall, it's very difficult to access uh, Chinese user data. In addition, because of the harsh data localization requirements, it also means that gaining reflexivity on China becomes even more harder. Uh, and this is uh, not to say that uh, it's impossible, actually. In fact, I think about seven, eight years ago, it was found that uh, using open source data that uh, a lot of this uh, these companies were collecting. Uh, the CIA was, for example, able to out uh, Chinese agents. Uh, China has also has alternatives in some domains. Uh, I hadn't written platforms in the uh, hierarchy of control because they can fall both under uh, operating systems, under apps, and sometimes even under websites. Uh, but when I say platforms here, I sort of mean uh, like the app platforms. So they do have platforms, they do have apps and infrastructure alternatives, but till now they did not have any operating system alternatives. Uh, but after the US ban on Huawei, we saw China rapidly trying to develop uh, domestic alternatives in the operating system to me. We saw, for example, Huawei coming up with HMS. So basically how it works is Android might be an open source operating system, but the Android that most people get is a Google-fied version of Android, if that makes sense. Basically it runs something called Google Mobile Services uh, to basically allow for a lot of tasks, uh, which otherwise just become very tedious on the Android operating system without any kind of mobile services to back them up. So for example, uh, mapping or browse or uh, web view or uh, basically a lot of things like that. Uh, Huawei basically used the same uh, open source code and developed a domestic alternative uh, of Android called Huawei with uh, Huawei mobile services. Uh, they also developed a distributed operating system, basically meaning an operating system which could both replace mobile operating systems as well as desktop operating systems. In addition to that, uh, the Chinese firm TCL, for example, has started the uh, Kai OS platform, which is the third major operating system and had a user base of over 100 million by 2020. Uh, and this was primarily meant for dumb phones. So this was basically uh, one superpower trying to get into a domain where the other superpower uh, black market share. Now, when we look at uh, semi-peripheral or regional powers, these are states, as I mentioned, have some amount of domestic alternatives, uh, but an important facet is uh, that distinguishes them from peripheral states is uh, that they have ambitions to become superpowers or poor countries. What that means is uh, they will attempt to limit uh, data collection from foreign entities as well as develop domestic alternatives, even though they might not have the ability to develop them completely. 
uh, and in case of uh, strategic competition with one superpower, they align with the other superpower uh, by using the higher order technology services of their ally uh, to basically reduce their flexibility, uh, reduce their dependence on the other superpower. Uh, we see uh, similar behavior in both India and China. So in India, for example, uh, there were very limited uh, domestic alternatives that major US companies dominate. But uh, the uh, PRC also had a great presence in the uh, apps and infrastructure domain, uh, but after strategic, uh, but after the clashes at the border, I think a year and a half ago now, uh, the Indian government banned uh, apps and uh, Huawei infrastructure apps included, I think there were 40 odd apps, much more than the US band. Uh, and uh, we saw that India had previously attempted data localization after the Snowden leaks, because the Snowden leaks had revealed that India was one of the most surveilled countries uh, in the world. Um, but uh, because of the US pressure and the increasing uh, strategic partnership with the US, that did not come to fruition. Uh, secondly, India's, uh, in terms of indigenization, we saw India, uh, in the Indian state actually develop an operating system, which is the boss operating system for uh, protecting uh, government employees from data collection. Similarly, uh, some days, which was supposed to be like a WhatsApp or a WeChat alternative, as well as Ku, which was even promoted abroad, especially after a country like Nigeria had a fallout with Twitter. Uh, similarly, the data protection law uh, or the bill right now has limited uh, localization because of US pressure, but uh, it does provide for sharing user data with the government, basically in essence, while not uh, angering its superpower ally, India still wants the ability to have access to all of its user data. Uh, similarly, we see in Russia uh, in 2012, there were a large number of protests and uh, this was blamed on US social media. Uh, the perception that was uh, propagated was that the internet is a CIA project and there were fears of regime change. Uh, in 2015, a localization law was, uh, was uh, put into force, which targeted especially uh, US firms. Uh, and uh, a lot of analysts believe that this was, in fact, intentional. Uh, at the same time, the Russian state supported, for example, uh, local tech giants, such as the Mail.ru group, as well as uh, increase their control over their data collection and editorial uh, abilities. Uh, the Russian state also compelled uh, companies to install hardware to give intelligence agencies access uh, to uh, decipher user data. Uh, as but because Russia also wants to be uh, has superpower ambitions and does not want to completely depend on China, even though, for example, Russia is uh, uh, still is using Huawei uh, 5G infrastructure. Even despite the security concerns, it enacted the sovereign internet law, which basically dis disconnects Russian internet from the entire world. Uh, another hedging behavior we see here is that in terms of AI surveillance, and especially after all these safeguards were put into force, we saw that uh, the AI surveillance equipment that the, the Russians have is sourced both from uh, its ally, uh, China, as well as its strategic competitor, the US. And in terms of the periphery, we saw we see Turkey, uh, which is a U.S. ally, but uh, has had a recent falling out with the U.S. In uh, 2016, there was an attempted coup, uh, which uh, the Turkish government blamed on the U.S. Uh, the ICT authority in this coup, after this coup, had the ability to take acquire any provider suspected of being a threat to national security, health, and morals of the public. Uh, it also banned a large number of uh, US apps uh, and also allowed for Chinese apps to have free access to the Chinese, uh, to the Turkish market. In terms of infrastructure, after the falling out for the US, 
because it's uh, Turkey's a peripheral state and did not have the ability to develop any domestic alternatives. It had to completely rely on China for infrastructure. So we saw, for example, Huawei's market share rise from three to 30% uh, by 2019. And uh, ZTE, for example, acquired uh, important projects uh, of, uh, in, for example, uh, the Istanbul airport. Uh, in terms of localization, it's interesting because uh, while on the face of it, it might seem that the Turkish localization bill is fairly neutral and does not discriminate against uh, what data is going out, we see that in practice, because a large number of US apps are already banned and the bill actually uh, has a provision which says that if uh, the data is, it vaguely says if the data is taken care of, uh, then the data can be transferred abroad. Uh, basically meaning giving a free pass uh, to Chinese companies to transfer data abroad. Can we go to the next slide, please, Chris? And this is the last slide. So in conclusion, well, domestic surveillance is subject to the privacy security dilemma in isolation. Uh, but in the international environment which states operate, this dilemma really does not apply. Uh, because privacy is a right conferred by the state upon its citizenry. Uh, when the fi very fundamental element of a state that is sovereignty is threatened because of the changing nature of warfare, states will, uh, will aim in differing ways to uh, limit reflexivity. However, this the purpose of this project is not to declare the death of privacy, uh, but to emphasize the international security considerations which basically drive state behavior. In an isolated national context, the privacy security dilemma can still be applicable, especially as a response to the citizenry. Thank you. Thanks, Samyak. Um, I hope that uh, everybody learned a little bit about how everybody's going to use your data around the world from this. It's a little sobering. <laughs> um, not quite as, as, as much fun as trying to convince kids to, on tick, to use TikTok to understand film. But it's pretty amazing, Samyak, makes me think back to when you were talking and considering the MLA, talking about your previous degrees and how you wanted to pull these two together. And we started thinking about the kind of courses that were out there uh, and how you could do uh, sort of in a way cybersecurity studies and international relations here in, in, uh, in Penn, thanks to the assets in the School of Arts, Science and Political Science, and also access to some courses in some other programs like the Louder Institute of International Studies. So I'm really glad that you had an opportunity to dig your teeth into these things. And now you're actually trying to put it into practice professionally. Tell me a little bit more about what you're doing uh, now as a fellow for work. Uh, so uh, as a fellow, I basically, uh, so the center basically focuses on nuclear security, space security, and cyber security. Uh, and my research sort of tries to tie some of those together at times. Some uh, but more often than not, it's actually a, a lot of it is a continuation of the capstone project. So uh, individual parts of it or uh, things which I did not get a chance to explore because of uh, either the time limit or the word limit, uh, I explore on that. So I've been writing about great power competition, uh, US-China tech competition through the, uh, the reflexive control framework. Um, I've also been working on things like uh, uh, the sci-fi conference, which happens every year, which is basically uh, all tech policy professionals get together and talk about what we can do about tech, as well as the Kalpana Jawla Space Dialogues, which is about uh, space security. Cool. Really fascinating. Well, thanks. I really appreciate uh, learning a little bit more about that subject. Um, our next speaker is Robert Scheier, who uh, came to the philosophy of science by way of physics and mathematics. He's an associate faculty fellow at Hill College House here on campus with his wife, Elizabeth. As fellows, they have 500 first year students to look after. So he said it's challenging, but it's a lot of fun. His capstone is on Hypatia, Theon, and Alexandrian mathematics. Robert. Great. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, let me share my screen. And let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Yes. Great. Okay. I got it. All right. Um, if I could just get this menu out of the way, I'd be all right. 
They don't see the menu. I see the menu. Yeah. Go to slideshow <laughs> and just start from slides. And yeah. What do I? Okay. So my project was on Hypatia Theon, who was her father, and Alexandrian mathematics. Now, why did I? How did I come to the MLA program? First off, there was no one department at Penn that satisfied all of my needs. And I did a lot of research about this, and there was no one department that really could allow me to do this project. Therefore, the MLA allowed me to take courses in other in a variety of uh, departments and put them together into a program that met my uh, what I wanted to do. So that's basically why I came to the MLA. Um, I've been thinking about this project for a long time, and it's something that I really wanted to write. So nobody knows what Hypatia looked like. But this is a common uh, picture of her that has been through history. Um, she lived roughly from 355 CE to, and she died in 415 CE. So who was Hypatia? Hypatia was the first female mathematician ever. She taught in Alexandria at the library at Alexandria where they had a school and all sorts of philosophers would come from all over the world to teach there. Um, and she was one of the teachers, probably the only female teacher. Now, why is she important? Well, as we found out, she rewrote books by Euclid, his elements, uh, by Ptolemy, the, Al uh, the uh, Almagest, uh, Diophantus, Arithmetica, and Apollonius, his conics. Now, what do I mean by rewrite? She was able to take these books and correct all the proofs and make them more intelligible to other readers. So really the copies of say Euclid elements that we have today are really were done by Hypatia. This is what the, uh, the research is showing. So her life, her father was Theon and he was in charge of the library at Alexandria. He was also the head teacher. Um, she was educated by tutors and she met all these people from around the world that came to Alexandria to teach. So they also tutored her. Um, she assisted her father with producing what are called scolia for existing te texts at first. That was her first project, scolia. It's not exactly footnotes. It's actually rewriting the text and putting in notes of your own to make it more legit, more in intelligible. Okay, so it's really is a big project. It's just not putting a couple of footnotes in, okay? Um, she re and therefore, we found that she rewrote texts such as Euclid and corrected all the proofs found in the elements. If you look at a copy of the elements before Hypatia had her uh, turn at them, you would find that most of the proofs are Im impossibly wrong. And that was something that she corrected. Uh, she taught both pagans and Christians in philosophy and mathematics. She didn't really care what their religion was. She was it was an, irrelevant to her. In fact, she was good friends with Orestes, who was a Christian, and he was the prefect of Alexandria. And he used to come to her lectures. And he, he, was, a, he was one of her students. Um, however, there was a, uh, a bishop of uh, Alexandria who came into power, Cyril, uh, and she was branded a witch. Now, why was she branded a witch? Well, she, she was a woman, and she was a teaching as a woman. And she made no bones about it. And she, she was very... Uh, open with her opinions and what she felt. And he didn't like it. And what happened is that um, he, enti he enticed a Christian mob, the Nit Nitrian monks, um, to murder her in the street when they found her one day out there. And unfortunately, she's remembered more for the matter of her death, which was pretty tragic, uh, than her mathematics. So. Did she author these texts? Well, all right, here's what we got so far. Theon, which was her father, explicitly says that Hypatia authored book three of Almagest, which was by Ptolemy. So what does that give us? That gives us, we know that she rewrote it. We know how, what her writing style is, and it's possible to analyze that writing style. Uh, this guy, uh, this uh, uh, person, Will, uh, Wilbur Noor, um, did some preliminary analysis, and he came up with these conclusions that the style of writing, say, uh, in some of these other works like Euclid, paralleled what Hypatia had written, her style. Um, above all, she was a Neoplatonist. Um, 
And that whole reason for our teaching math is that it, it points to the existence of the one, okay? Um, the one is primarily, it's of primary importance in, in, in Neoplatonism. Um, she was all of her, and all of her work was, met, was motivated by that um, because foremost, you know, she was a philosopher and her main job was to teach philosophy and that's what she taught. Um, so if we think, if we look at what Noor has, has concluded, um, Hypatia rewrote quite a bit of the classical works that we have found. So to summarize what she did, well, this is what she's all about. She was the first female mathematician in history, but not credited, credited very well, because after all, men wrote the history of mathematics. Uh, there's a book called Men of Mathematics, and there's no mention of Hypatia or any of the other um, women mathematicians throughout the ages. Um, she rewrote these texts by Euclid, Ptolemy, Apollonius, and Diophantus. Um, we're pretty sure she did, based on what uh, Noor has said. Um, she taught philosophy and math, at Alexandria. I think what she should be is a hero to young women in STEM fields today, because it shows what you can do, what a woman can do, even in ancient times, um, that she survived the male dominated profession and she's become known by her accomplishments. So well, unfortunately though, everybody just remembers her death uh, by, at the hands of the uh, mob and that's what people have, that's what historians have, have uh, capitalized on. Um, but I, there's a lot more to her. Um, and if I decide, and it looks like it actually, if I go for the master of philosophy, um, there uh, I'm going to look more into analyzing the text using a, um, artificial intelligence methods. There are some new papers that are out um, that use artificial intelligence, talk about using artificial intelligence for textual analysis. And it's something I'm going to try with ancient Greek to see what I come up with. And that's my presentation. Thank you. And I'll share my screen. All right. Thanks, Robert. Hey, We're one back. of the questions that you know pops into my head is um, you know thinking about her in, in the common era. And having to bump up against um, Cyril and the the uh, church hierarchy in Alexandria, and that comes to her ultimate downfall, if you will, not there any um, problems of her own. You mentioned that there's an issue with the gender dynamic, both at during her lifetime and then in history of mathematics, looking back, right? Men of math as opposed to famous mathematicians. But do you, I also wonder, with the history of the delivery of ancient classical mathematics to us. Greek texts oftentimes surviving in uh, sort of bastardized versions, either in Latin or even coming to us like the title, the Amagest, coming to us through Arabic, which then is translated back into Latin right. uh, and then matched up with snippets of Greek. Um, is there something that might have to do with understanding her position as a tr uh, uh, someone who transmits Euclid, but isn't really original or own terms? And could any of that be colored by the fact that um, she lived in the fourth century, uh, um, you know, AD or CE, um, and that might mean that she's not really a true Platonic classical pagan Greek, mm -hmm. but instead is colored by the rise of, uh, especially in North Africa and Alexandria, rather really virulent um, uh, sort of imperial Christianity at the time. Is there? Did you explore any other issues like that? history of religion, as well as gender studies that influenced how you understand Hypatia and her relevance? Um, well, for, um, for one thing, she didn't really think about the fact that she was a woman. Um, she thought of herself as a philosopher. Okay. Okay, to uh, start. Um, but she was in a very, very Christian era. Um, prior to her birth, they had burned the, uh, the Christians had burned the Temple of Seraphis. Okay. And um, they did some other. They, they were taking down uh, pagan uh, monuments and also pagan uh, sites of worship, pagan temples. They were turned into churches. So this is the type of atmosphere. This is the type of environment that she was immersed in as a Neoplatonist. Um, some of the uh, some of her Christian students uh, took to Neoplatonism. It um, 
it verified what they thought of what they thought about uh, Christianity. Um, what else did I leave out? <laughs> Now you said you sort of came to this um, originally. You were really interested in physics and math. Um, yes. How did how did physics and math play a role when you getting interested in philosophy? Um, I've always been interested in actually a lot of things. Um, had it had it turned out differently, I would have been an English major in college. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as it turned out, I, I majored in physics and math. I was an engineer, and when engineering the started to uh, bore me basically. Um, I came back to Penn to pursue, uh, to pursue this work. Philosophy has always really, really interested me, especially philosophy of science, philosophy of math. Um, and that's really, I think that's my true, that, that really was my true calling. If I had followed you know, what I was thinking at the time, I would have been a philosopher. Well, now I'm a philosopher. <laughs> Well, you're also sort of mathematical and scientific historian, which is kind of fascinating as well. Yeah, there aren't many of us around. <laughs> the last one died in 1930. Well, it's great that you're on campus and you have students as a fellow that you can engage with, and hopefully some of them will, will really get excited about this sort of very interdisciplinary approach you have to, to history, to classics, to math and science and philosophy, uh, and you'll be able to share with them and maybe uh, go further and do some research with using AI to study Hypatia, to study the language um, of those texts, to figure out really uh, maybe where her hand is in some of the, what we know about Euclid and Ptolemy, who we really see as, as the people that sort of put us on a path to better understanding the physical environment um, and mathematical modeling and sort of see exactly what kind of role she played. It's really fascinating. So I'm looking forward to you doing more. I do talk to the young ladies here, um, STEM majors, about uh -huh. Hypatia. Um, they, no, of course, they've never heard of her. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm changing it slowly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks a lot, Robert. Really Thank appreciate you. hearing from you. Um, our next speaker is Emily Waller. She's an English teacher and residential faculty member at the Westtown School, Quaker boarding school outside of Philadelphia. Her concentration in the MLA program was gender, literary theory, and classical literature. She would love to be a lifelong student, and teaching's the next best thing she finds. Her capstone is called Gender Ambiguity and Reversible Potentiality, Psychoanalytic Studies in Longus and Achilles Tatius. Emily. Thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone else for such a diversity of um, perspectives and projects. It's great to hear from fellow MLAers. Um, my capstone project, which I'll be presenting um, a snippet of today, um, engaged in psychoanalytic studies of gender and the gaze um, in two of the five extant ancient Greek novels. Um, so I'll be presenting the concept at the core of my capstone, which I called uh, reversible potentiality. Before I do so, I wanna begin by saying that this project is through and through a testament to the strengths of the Masters of Liberal Arts program. My interest in the ancient Greek novels was sparked during my first semester of study in the MLA um, as I came across an obscure reference to the novels in a survey text that was assigned by Chris Raberman for the History of Sexuality course. The brief mention spurred my curiosity um, and I retrieved a copy of Brian Reardon's uh, collected ancient Greek novels and immediately was hooked on the material. Um, while my coursework in the MLA has reflected the broad scope of my academic interests, ranging from philosophy to literary criticism to classical studies, the freedom and diversity of the program has allowed me to return time and again to the novels with fresh insights and nuanced perspectives. Professor Raberman's course prompted me to write an analysis of the novels within the broader history of sexuality. Professor Brillmeyer's course on theories of the subject inspired a post-humanist analysis of the novels. Professor Platt's survey course on literary theory led me to a Bakhtinian analysis of the novels. And in each of these various contexts, I was challenged to approach the literature not as a classicist, but as a student of history, philosophy, literary theory, and sexuality. 
at the end of my program, I really regard this as a unique strength of the MLA program, as I had the opportunity to um, deepen my focus on one very particular subject while also broadening and diversifying my approach to it. Additionally, amidst ongoing discussions um, throughout academia about the relevance of the classics for contemporary readers, the MLA program allowed me to research and write this capstone, not from the ivory towers of academia, but in the halls of a secondary school, much like RAN. Um, and not only that, but to do it during a worldwide pandemic, economic crisis, and national reckoning over racial injustice. So I've spent the last year alternatingly poring over psychoanalytic theory and ancient texts and crafting a high school course titled Classical Connections, which explores the very question of the relevance of classical texts for teenage students. That is to say, my research has not emerged in a vacuum. I spent much of my final semester trying to adequately answer high school students who approached me asking, do ancient stories really matter to me? As I've encountered the classics in new ways throughout the MLA, my belief in the capability of classical literature to speak into modern life has only deepened. In entering the scholarly dialogue on the ancient novels, um, a dialogue which historically has been replete with patriarchal assumptions about their readership, literary value, and authorial intent, I hope that my capstone research demonstrates the value of fresh readings and nuanced approaches particularly those which call on a diverse canon of theoretical perspectives. Uh, this, in my estimation, this type of interdisciplinary methodological concern truly reflects the values at the core of the MLA program. As the earliest iterations of novelistic discourse, the ancient Greek romances follow a similar, almost identical stock plot, um, all five of them. They begin with love at first sight, uh, the meat cute, if you will. Um, they take their protagonists through kidnappings, attempted rapes, rival suitors, fake deaths, mistaken identities, um, all ending with the two lovers reunion and marriage. Um, I like to joke that if you've seen The Princess Bride, it's more or less the plot of that story um, bottled in an ancient format. While this may sound like a tired bag of romantic tropes, I was intensely intrigued by what I saw as the novel's untapped potential to converse with contemporary theories of gender and sexuality. Scholars have traditionally focused their studies on the novel's violence toward female heroines, their celebration of heterosexual marriage, and their near propagandistic focus on heterosexual love as the foundation of social order. I, on the other hand, read the novels in quite a different way. I noticed very little difference between the male and female lovers at the core of these stories. And I felt like the male hero's intense empathy for their female counterparts often accounted for the resemblance between men and women in the stories. Where one might expect the knight in shining armor of medieval romance, uh, the novels present male lovers who look more like stereotypical damsels in distress. They're naive, effeminate, emotional, and often incapable. They're additionally desired for their beauty by lustful adults, just the same as their female counterparts. Noting this similarity between the protagonists, David Constan argued in his 1994 monograph, Sexual Symmetry, that the ancient novels marked a turning point in ancient literary depictions of heterosexual desire, displacing former pederastic models of mastery and submission with a new model of sexual symmetry, which was predicated on the mutuality of male and female love. While my research was largely inspired by David Constan's work, and he graciously guided me through the research process as one of my readers, the term symmetry did not quite sit well with me. First, because it denotes a static sameness, whereas I saw this resemblance and reciprocity between the young lovers as contained within the stage of adolescence. Second, because it insinuated an actualized sameness between the male and female lovers, a notion which I rejected on the basis that no two people, particularly two individuals of different gender identities who've been socially conditioned in a patriarchal culture, can share truly symmetrical experiences. 
To argue for strict symmetry, in my estimation, is to erase the embodiment of male and female subjects. Instead, I describe the relationship of the lovers as one of reversible potentiality. By reversible potentiality, I mean that any given act of the subject represents the radical potential for the subject to be acted upon. So for instance, touching necessitates being touched. Seeing exposes one to the possibility of being seen or being exposed. Wounding implies one's vulnerability to be wounded. The term was inspired initially by a Freudian concept published in Instincts and Their Vicissitudes. Floyd, Freud writes that masochism is actually sadism turned around upon the subject's own ego, and that exhibitionism includes looking at one's own body. Analytic observation, indeed, leaves in us no doubt that the masochist shares in the enjoyment of his display, and that the exhibitionist shares in the enjoyment of the sight of his exposure. On this basis, I regard gender in the novel not as a fixed position in which men occupy the role of mastery and women as that of subjection. However, as opposed to actual symmetry or sameness between the two lovers, I argue that the resemblance between them denotes the possibility for each to become an object for the other. Gender identities do not correspond to fixed subject positions. Instead, gender is an inherently reversible position in which both subjects are vulnerable to objectification and domination. All of this is incredibly theoretical and abstract. Um, so how does this reversible potentiality manifest itself in the novels? I wanna direct us to two examples to demonstrate this. First, I'll direct us to a scene in Achilles Tatius's Leucippe and Clitophon. The passage projected here occurs um, after the two protagonists, Leucippe and Clitophon, have fallen in love at first sight. They've attempted to sail away together and elope, and they've been separated by a band of pirates who kidnap Leucippe and now intend to sacrifice her to the gods. Unbeknownst to the pirates, Clitophon is spying from afar, witnessing the entire graphic scene and relating it in first person to the reader. Despite the gruesomeness of the sacrifice, Clitophon continues to stare, paralyzed, noting, as you'll see toward the bottom of this quotation, perhaps the myth of Niobe was no fiction at all. Faced with the carnage of her children, she felt just as I did, and her emotional paralysis had given the appearance of petrification. Horrified by what he's seen, Clitophon proceeds to attempt suicide at the sight of Lucifer's killing by plunging a sword into his throat. However, in a very dramatic show, she awakens just in time um, to keep him from committing suicide and reveal that the sacrifice was actually an elaborate staged performance using an animal hide and a retractable dagger. This passage has been regarded by scholars as a demonstration of the novel's prioritization of the sadistic male gaze and the fetishization of violence toward women. So how might our insight from Freud aid us in approaching the text from a different angle? First, it's important to note the gender reversal in the allusions in this passage. Lucippe is likened to Marcius, pictured to the right, um, and Clitophon to Niobe, um, who is a mythical mother bereaved of her children. Likening Lucippe to a wounded man and himself to a bereaved mother, reveals the extent to which Clitophon imagines the male body, and indeed his own body, in the exposure and dismemberment of Lucippe. Second, not only does Clitophon imagine this pain on the side of his own body, but he attempts to join her fate by plunging a dagger down his throat. With this action, he moves from the position of the sadistic male voyeur to that of the masochistic exhibitionist, mirroring the violence done to his female counterpart. The revelation of Lucippe's performance only heightens the comedy of Clitophon's masochistic guilt. His stage suicide is intended to mimic a performance that was itself mimicking real violence. He's empathizing in the extreme with a feminine pain that even Lucippe is spared from. In this, he ironically feels more like a woman than even Lucippe. Clitophon's reversal from voyeur to exhibitionist, from sadist to masochist, demonstrates the inherent instability of subject positions and the abiding presence of the gaze 
which often refashions subjects as objects without their knowledge. In the act of looking, a subject is automatically implicated in the field of the gaze and therefore vulnerable to the gaze from without. Let us look briefly at one other example, um, this time from Longus's Daphnis and Chloe. This passage recounts the moment in which Chloe, a young shepherdess, falls in love with Daphnis as she watches him bathe. As you can see here, seeing and touching Daphnis compels her to re-envision and in turn touch her own body. So as she assumes a subjective identity, she simultaneously becomes an object for herself and for others. She invites him to bathe three times in front of her. And in the final instance, um, the text recounts that she quote, put on his clothes when he was bathing and naked. So she cosplays as the man as she takes part um, as she takes up the part of the male voyeur, while Daphnis snatched the pine garland from her head and put it on his own. So he therefore takes up the part of the female exhibitionist delighting in her display. After this series of voyeuristic encounters in which Chloe is the voyeur, a reversal takes place and she takes the role of the exhibitionist, stripping and bathing before Daphnis while knowingly feeling his gaze on her. In this sequence of cross-dressing and exposure, Chloe demonstrates the fluidity of her position as a voyeur. She dresses herself as a man and objectifies the male body and then strips and invite, invites him to objectify her body. In this, gender and subjectivity are presented in the novels as constructed and performative and therefore inherently reversible. Gazing upon Daphnis heightens Chloe's recognition of her own vulnerability to his gaze. In both of these scenes, the lovers enact physical rituals to mirror the phenomenal experience of their partner. Clitophon replicates Leucippe's suffering with his suicide attempt and Daphnis and Chloe engaged in cross-dressing as sort of a demonstration of their empathy with one another's experiences. The body is thereby reconfigured to externalize the lover's overwhelming psychic identification with the beloved, male subjects identification with female experiences and female subjects identification with male experiences. In my readings of these respective passages throughout my capstone, I've sought to challenge theories of the gaze which indelibly fix men in the position of seer and women in the position of object arguing instead that subject and object positions are reversible and not inherently tied to any particular body or gender identity. I'll end with a very frank question straight from the mouth of my students, which is, does this really matter? Um, of course, having spent the past year working on this research, I'm a bit biased to immediately and enthusiastically answer that yes, it matters greatly, um, but I truly believe that it does. Um, I believe that this research bears important implications for both gender theory and classical studies. In the field of gender studies, disrupting bimodal models of the subject necessitates reevaluating our assumptions about the male gaze, gendered violence, and positions of power. In my conceptualization of reversible potentiality, I've sought to dismantle normative understandings of sight, knowledge, and power as necessarily fixed to binaristic understandings of gender and subjectivity. Instead, reading gender and the body as plastic, performative, and constructed. Likewise, the field of classical studies has much to offer contemporary theoretical dialogues if it can embrace interdisciplinary methodologies and expand beyond traditional readings. I've taken this nuanced approach to the novels, not simply because reading and reinscribing ancient sexism is tiresome, as classicist Helen Morales has stated, though I do indeed find reinscribing ancient sexism tiresome, um, but also because I believe that if we can't read beyond the novel's normative context, we diminish the possible readings and productive meanings for us as modern readers. This is true for ancient literature more broadly as well. In breaking free of the necessity to strictly recreate ancient conceptions of gender in the body, I've strived to view ancient literature in a new light, one which does not limit the scope of its significance to historical or literary concerns, but which seeks to utilize the classics to theorize gender, power, and the body in new ways. Thank you all.
Um, thanks, Emily. Really fascinating. Um, a couple of things come to mind, uh, you know, thinking about this. Um, first of all, I like your idea of reversible potentiality. I'll come to that. What I really liked was the fact that one of your readers was someone whose work you admired and whose work you read. And because of your interest in the subject and your confidence from your training and your coursework, you were actually willing to write a capstone that sort of rejected or inverted some of David Conti's positions. And you still asked him to be your reader. And he said, yes, that's pretty fascinating. Um, so I'm proud of you for that. But it, it makes me think um, I, of something I often say during orientation with students is remember the difference between undergrad and grad school. As an undergrad, you're usually receiving wisdom, receiving knowledge, and hopefully going to apply it later. But in grad school, you're oftentimes questioning assumptions and asking experts to defend their position and maybe taking things in a new direction. And you're growing knowledge. You're actually right now wrestling with really where should gender studies and classical studies go next, which I think is really fascinating. So, so kudos to you and to everyone else who presents tonight, because that's really important, is that knowledge isn't static um, and understanding where we can go and breaking new ground is really a lot of fun. Uh, so I, I really think that's excellent work. The one thing well, I, if I, I can, If I can interject just briefly as sure. well, Chris, I will say too, um, beyond all of the really fruitful insight that I received from David regarding the subject matter itself, he was also um, a masterclass in academic humility. And so, especially in a discipline that um, is steeped in tradition and there are a lot of egos and closed doors, um, he was incredibly willing to have someone from outside of classical studies critique his work and engage with me in a way that was incredibly humble and willing to grapple with my questions and at times really openly say, you know, I don't know if I would write that same thing now. And it was um, really impressive and amazing to me. That's super. Um, but the more substantive question about your subject, I think that's really cool. And that's really great that you had that opportunity. So I'm glad you sort of took that and ran with it. Um, do you see anything different in the, the novels versus the say more, um, what we really think of the classics is plays and epic poetry. Do you see um, a resistance to that kind of potentiality or uh, gender bending in those uh, media, if you will, or, or literary uh, um, types than you see in the novels, right? Well, yeah, I, well, and I would be, this is an area that I would love to expand my research into because I've, I've um, not done as much exploration of what this concept would look like in, um, uh, earlier classical works or different um, sort of literary genres. Mm -hmm. One thing that I found really compelling about the way in which I saw this concept play out in imperial literature and in prose was that the novels uh, were popularized and written during a time in which conceptions of the body and sexuality and gender were really changing because of um, Christianity coming onto the scene and because of some um, social and cultural dynamics that were happening around um, concerns about preserving the nuclear family, particularly those of noble, noble families, noble lines, concerns about illegitimate children. And so um, the scholarly focus on kind of their social propaganda is not completely unfounded because they did have kind of a social, um, a social working to them, almost similar to what Rand is describing with, or was describing with the way in which film kind of has a corporate um, agenda behind it, the novels certainly did as well. Um, and, and I think that as they were, as the uh, society was moving away from a pederastic model, um, this type of interaction between men and women um, was a bit unique to the time frame. I will say one of the chapters, I sort of explored the why of this. And I mentioned briefly that I saw this phenomenon as contained within adolescence. And a lot of that was because within a pederastic culture, um, young boys were sexualized in a way that was very similar to young women. And so the um, education that they were receiving in manhood had a lot to do with becoming the active sexual partner rather than the passive, which they had been sort of cultured uh, in their earlier lives to do. Um, so I would be 
to, to sort of answer your question, I, I would just be really interested to, to know um, what that might look like in other literatures, but I would suspect that the historical moment makes this sort of a okay. unique canon. Yeah, yeah, it could be the, um, the, the larger historical and political context as opposed to uh, the type of literature um, that impacts exactly what the authors are gonna try to accomplish and convey to their audience. Um, but it'd be interesting to see uh, you know, but, uh, you know, it makes the, the question that, that popped into my head was really thinking hard about the novel as being a place where you could be maybe a little bit more loose, a little more transgressive. And I think of this because in a couple of ways in, in, in things I've done, I worked a, a lot in Italian Renaissance and a lot on agriculture and, and country houses. And out in the country, away from the city, away from the world of business, um, you could be a lot more loose in your uh, approach to understanding what was funny uh, what was high-minded, um, how to understand social roles. Um, so you weren't bound by the same strictures because you were in a different location in a way. And that allowed you to change how you approach things intellectually uh, and, and maybe socially uh, in dealing with your peers and, and uh, daily life. Um, and similarly, I also found um, in some of my, re my work, because um, I looked a lot at how the Italian um, early modern elite class responded to knowledge coming from classical antiquity, but also from different parts of the world. The New World as they were uncovering things and also from the Islamic Mediterranean. So these sort of um, competing cultural entities oftentimes were seen as being at, at odds, but in certain zones of knowledge, their knowledge was understood as actually being really accessible and really valuable. So for example, going to Robert's paper and talking about Euclid and Ptolemy, uh, Islamic authors of scientific, mathematical, and medical texts were really seen as prized and valuable contributions to modern contemporary culture, 16th century, where some of their other writings were not. So there's a really interesting way of positioning your culture from a hegemonic point of view and those other cultures that you traded with, that you um, were, were, that were your adversaries, you know, sort of tapping into um, the, you know, the kind of things that we're talking about with Simonock's paper, and then figure out where common ground might be. So I think you know, what you're doing is, is really exploring some things that have a lot to do with the social context, changing understandings of identity and gender roles, and then also how that fits into these different um, literary um, devices that come to play, certainly in the novel. I'd be interested to see where they are in other novelistic traditions, but also in the other types of um, literature that we really know well in the classics, particularly epic poetry and, and, um, and the plays that they had um, such sort of a, a devotion to at sort of this interesting um, competitive level. Well, and certainly your, um, your point about genre, I found it really interesting as well that in ancient tragedy, um, it was the custom if a, particularly if a woman was going to die that she didn't die on stage, that, that the actor would retire to one of the wings and you would hear the death, but not actually see it. And so the, um, the genre of the novel actually allowed this relationship with envisioning violence in a very different and much more of sort of private way, to borrow your word, transgressive, these actions that were not necessarily socially sanctioned now had a private forum in which anybody could engage with transgressive material. Yeah, really, really fascinating. Uh, it also makes me think that one of the important things in Dear Scenes, comedy and tragedy is how many people are still standing on the stage at the end. And I like that in the novel, the first um, uh, couple that um, he tries to kill himself because she thinks she's dead, but she's not dead and she stops her from dying. That means it's still a novel and it's still mildly comedic, but Shakespeare or any other tragedian would have had one of them die and an and accident in her. And as, as my uh, daughter thinking to Ren saying, you got into film, uh, this idea of studying film culture because of your boys and what they watch, um, you know, my, my one, I, used, I would say my younger daughter is now in high school. When she was a younger, she really loved opera when it came on Sunday mornings um, because of the utter sort of pump, mixture of pomposity and ridiculousness in the motivations of the characters and the way things end. And we were watching the, the, the balletic opera uh, Romeo and Juliet, the, the, French, by, um, the, 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 the French version, and it was funny, after she was done, I was like, well, what do we get from this? Life lessons from opera. And she said, everybody involved in the plan has to know the plan, right? Because Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy because 
one of them doesn't know the other one's not really dead. So in your not Greek novel, it's really fascinating that the surprise has still has a good outcome because she saves him. So she's effectively the, the, the heroine uh, in that story as it comes to its denouement, which is really kind of cool too, because that itself is really reversible from what we understand uh, of the depiction of what roles people play in, in classical literature. So it's really cool. Great stuff. Thank you. I really uh, thought you guys all gave great presentations, really fascinating work, the range and breadth of topics is, is, is something else. I, I'm kind of dazzled every year when we have the forum about the kind of things that y'all do in your classes, pull together into your concentrations and then take out on the road in these final projects. And it, it's great to see so many of you thinking about what you're gonna do with the next. You're gonna use them in the classroom, you're gonna use them for another degree, you're gonna use them to publish, you're gonna use them in the workplace. Uh, really, really great. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys spending some time uh, with us and, and sharing this with um, the audience. And I'm sure a lot of folks are going to be able to watch the you know, videos later uh, and, and take something away from the, the really neat work you're doing. Do you guys have any final comments you want to share? Any questions for each other? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. I, I, I have a question for Ren. I, I was just curious. In your uh, in, in the curriculum you're designing or thinking about, um, is is there is there any role for the printed word at all? Do you do you connect? Do you, do you make the kids make any connection between you know uh, uh, a film that's based on a on a short story or a novel and the printed version and try to relate it that way, or is that just futile? No, not at all, actually. And and in the curriculum I'm teaching now. Um, there's obviously room for the printed word, but not, I think, in the way that you mean. But the plan of taking those six units and grafting them across seventh through twelfth grade, I mean, one of the things I write about that I didn't go into tonight is the incredible opportunities to create dialogue between the texts that you read and those that you study in film. Maybe the most obvious example I talked about is, you know, the hours is based on the writing of and plot of Mrs. Dalloway and like our our AP literature class last year at my school read Mrs. Dalloway and I mean that would be a, a perfect example of, of obvious and, and clear connection. I think when you look at something like uh, do the right thing or an equivalent because obviously the age you need to be thoughtful about you know eighth graders that that's a very intense viewing experience but one of the things that that's essays that we read is is after that is sort of why is there such an obsession with sort of the the ra racial reconciliation movies well i think if you're teaching to kill a mockingbird now effectively that's a lens you need to take on it um is to at least consider the sort of white savior complex element of it so i think again maybe not do the right thing exactly but finding a, a film that grapples with race in one way and then looks at To Kill a Mockingbird, there's a really interesting dialogue to be, to be had there. So I think when, you, when I'm planning to get English teachers like Emily enthusiastic about this, I think it'll be, it would be very important to say, yeah, you can absolutely teach this film alongside your favorite piece of uh, you know, classical literature. Yeah, I think it, that it might have some merit also because, you know, having two kids go through high school and go through AP literature and talk about what they're being forced to read um, and why they do or don't feel it's contributing anything at all to what to their education. Um, I think being able to relate it to things like film, to things like poetry, to things like philosophy, to, to be a little more interdisciplinary in their approach would be, I think, a way of keep giving this a little bit more um, relevance and resonance. Uh, which could be uh, pretty nice. Yeah, and I, I could go on, of course, forever, but like, you know, I read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair in high school. It, it was very interesting. I obviously remember it, but boy, The Jungle alongside Food, Inc. Oh, how yeah. much more <laughs> like dynamic and, and bringing that into the current moment would that make it? Obviously, a, a huge degree. So, so yeah, that I think that's part of the fun. Super. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. It was really great to have you guys present. Uh, enjoyed hearing more about your projects. I'm glad this year I didn't get advanced um, copies of your text because I was a little more surprised, which was a lot more fun. 
Um, and I hope the audience had a great time. Uh, so uh, I think another good uh, forum, really appreciate it. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Bye. for presenting um, and uh, have a great night. Thank you.